This morning we have a special treat. Pastor Jim and Missy um, are going to share their testimony. And I heard somebody this week uh, tell Pastor Jim, said, I've never heard you share that story. And um, I know that he comes to this with, uh, everybody loves their kids. And so it comes as a, a difficult testimony for them to share. So I've been praying for them this week. And, um, and I was struck when he made the statement back. He said, I don't know that I've ever been ready to share this story. And so um, we get to see into the heart of Pastor Jim and Missy today and how God's been in their hearts. And I thank God for them and for uh, their ministry here at Gospel Center. So come and share with us. We love you. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers. A uh, little bit ago, uh, Mark read Psalm 23. It's a psalm of great encouragement and promise. And God promises us his protection and his, his provision, his presence, even in the deepest, darkest valleys. In fact, verse 4 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. He's with us even in those dark valleys, the shadow of death. But what happens when you find yourself stuck in that valley for two and a half years? That's where Misty and I found ourselves. But God was with us in that valley. And today we want to tell you how he, today and, and actually next week also, we want to tell you how he blessed us in that valley. And next week we're going to talk about how he led us out of that valley. But right now, we'll get started and we'll just pray right now. We thank you, Lord, for um, being with us in the valleys. We thank you that uh, you're never far away. And so today, Lord, we pray that you would bless us as we share your word. May we um, see what you would, say what you would have us to say in a way that would be pleasing to you. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, hon. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. I am Missy, and I'm going to start this wonderful journey. I was born and grew up in Ohio in the home of a missionary church pastor's family. And of course, the only place you could go to college was Bethel in, in Mishawaka, Indiana. So I changed from a Buckeye to a Hoosier. While attending Bethel, my roommate and I did not have classes over the noon hour. So we went across the street and convinced the manager at Sandy's Drive-In, which is now Arby's on McKinley, to hire us. At that time, only guys worked there. So we got our special little white uniforms and you, matching headbands. You were adorable. And um, we only had to work the counters. They didn't make us clean up. They spoiled us. It was wonderful. And guess who was there grilling cheeseburgers? Jim Bear. And the rest, they say, is history. That's a whole other story that would take an hour to tell you. In our early marriage, we helped start a church in South Bend called the Christian Community Center. And Phyllis Marks also helped with that. In fact, she lived at the center. And today that church is known as Keller Park Missionary, so it's still going. After a couple of years of serving there, Gospel Center was seeking a director for their preschool, which was called Mother's Helpers. I accepted the job, so we started accepting, attending Gospel Center when our youngest son, Jamie, was about two years old. We quickly got involved in the Sunday school class for young adults. Some of you might remember the J.C. Salt and Pepper Company. And there we made lifelong friends. We became Gospel Center youth sponsors, and then Pastor Bob Keller drug us into children's ministry. At a young couple's weekend retreat in September of 1973, we had to leave in the middle of the night from Camp Mac and get to the hospital in South Bend just in time for Jad Daniel Bear to be born. So we then had two sons, Jamie and Jad, our little sports characters you can see on the screen there. And then in December of 1979, Gerald Denton, who many of you don't even know that's his name because you call him Paco, arrived and we finally had our family of my three sons. As Pastor Bob Keller got us more involved in children's ministry and even puppetry, we decided we needed more training. So we would attend the Fellowship of Christian Magicians every summer in Winona Lake. 
and that is where we met Sheldon Rhodes. We went for puppet training, but we ended up honing our skills, our boys and us, with clowning, juggling, ballooning, gospel magic, and storytelling. So then we would spend our summers, since we were school teachers, doing Bible schools and camps all around the Midwest. We were even privileged to take our puppet ministry to Honduras, Bolivia, and Peru. <clears throat> as our ministry expanded, we outgrew our home. As puppets, magic, clown supplies, and even doves took over. We were going to add a room onto our house, but at that time, Penn Harris Madison had an auction for a school they were closing. We bid on Fulmer School and won out over eight bidders. The next one and a half years were grueling as we renovated. Lots of help from people here at Gospel Center and our family. Over 100 gallons of paint, 142 tubes of window caulk, and sanding. I thought Jim was going to lose his hearing. Huh? <laughs> we sanded all the floors. So we weren't finished renovating, but we decided to go ahead and move into our 11,000 square foot home in January of 89. And there we are on the porch. Can you imagine raising three boys in a home, 11,000 square feet? The, we would play laser tag when Missy left uh, <laughs> because we didn't want to play laser tag when she was there. We even had a gymnasium. And so um, that was a big deal. And I had a, my family had all, always been sports-oriented. And so I wanted my sons to be in sports because I knew at, uh, active boys were tired boys and tired boys got into less trouble. And that was usually the case. So my sons tried all different kinds of sports. Uh, the next slide will show you some of those. They, um, they tried everything. Um, our oldest, our, our middle son, Jad, was, while he was in middle school, was involved in football, basketball, and track. But by far, his favorite sport was basketball. Following his uh, loss by his team, his ninth grade, uh, his freshman team, in the, um, in the conference finals, he came to us and he, and he told us that he had a problem. He told us his cyst had been injured in basketball and was swollen and wouldn't go down. At birth, Jad had been born with a silver dollar size red hemangioma on his hip area right below his waist. I would always have to tell nursery workers about it so they wouldn't freak out if they changed his diaper. Over the years, various doctors had said not to worry about it unless it bothered him. Well, it was now bothering him. So we canceled our spring break plans and had surgery, but it wouldn't heal. I called the doctor on a Sunday when the rest of the family was at church and told the doctor it was bleeding again. And the doctor blurted out, well, I think it's cancer. After the shock of that, we chose a different doctor and went to a local cancer specialist who said it was fibrosarcoma which attacks the fibers and connective tissues in your body, and he suggested we go to the University of Chicago. In May, at the University of Chicago, Jad had surgery that removed an area eight inches by 10 inches by one inch deep on his hip area. So he also had to have a very large skin graft taken from his leg. The doctor said he would be on crutches for three months and not run for a year. But Jad was a fighter, and crutches were gone in a month, and he went out for basketball at Penn later that year. We had a special pad made to protect what he humorously called his shark bite. But the lowest point of Jad's uh, athletic career was probably the day he got cut from Penn's basketball team. He had... Uh, Defying the experts, he decided he was going to get himself in the best shape of his life. He ran, he jumped, he used these special shoes to uh, strengthen his, his body. He worked two or three hours every night in our gym. He got so good that it, it, he got, it was so, such good shape, but at six foot tall, he was able to dunk a basketball a couple of different ways. 
So he went off for Penn's basketball team, and, uh, and he was in better shape than anybody else that went out for the basketball team. And he, uh, he worked and he worked. After tryouts each day, he would come home and, uh, and practice for two or three more hours just to hone his skills and hone his uh, endurance. His assistant coaches, the trainer, they all said, well, you're definitely going to make the team. You're one of the better players out there. But when the final cuts came, the head coach decided to keep four spots for the football team, which was still in the playoffs. And so that didn't leave any space for Jad. He was devastated. And let me assure you, his mom and dad were devastated too. So Jad determined to join his dad and his older brother in playing for the Wakarusa Missionary Church basketball team in a league that played here at Gospel Center. That was the year that I blew out my knee and ended my stellar basketball career, which wasn't, ter <laughs> which wasn't terribly stellar. But it was the best year of basketball I ever had because I got to spend it on the same team with, with two Dang. of my sons. So every three months, we would have x-rays of Jad's lungs because the lungs are the body's tiny filtering system. We were so excited. We made it to May 16th, a year later. But and then in late May, a tumor was found in his lung. Surgery was scheduled for a month later, so Jad made the most of that month. Uh, Homer Drew, who had been the coach at, at Bethel College, was now the coach at Valparaiso University. And Homer found out about Jad's situation, and so he invited him to the Valpo basketball camp. So he spent a week playing basketball, and he just went crazy over that. We also spent a week in Port Huron, Michigan, doing a Bible school with Bob and Eleanor Keller at the Colonial Woods Missionary Church. His youth group went, uh, was going to Cedar Point, so he went with them to Cedar Point and had a fabulous day. We went to Crazy Cousins Reunion in New York and even stopped like at 2 o'clock in the morning to see Niagara Falls. <laughs> and he even got his driver's license, so we had to stay off the sidewalk for a while. But... Uh, but he did, made that most of that month. Before his lung surgery on June 29, 1990, was the only time Jad broke down and cried. And he asked, why me? His dad was ready with several passages from the Bible that Jad started calling his perseverance verses. And we'd like to share those with you. One of them was uh, James 1, 2 through 4, which said, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And then in Romans, But we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And then we see in Second Peter these words, for this very reason make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. For if, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And another one in James that was one of my favorite. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. It was a long, difficult surgery. They removed the upper lobe of his lung, parts of three ribs, and shaved his spine because the tumor was starting to invade it. We had wonderful, honest doctors at Weiler's Children's Hospital within the University of Chicago. They told Jed they really didn't have a protocol to follow for this type of tumor. Why, why was that? Because it was usually, they called it an elderly man's disease, and elderly men never opted for any treatments. But they were willing to try four different chemos or poisons, as they called it. 
Chemo kills all fast-growing cells. So besides the tumor, it also destroys your hair, your mouth lining, your nails, your stomach, your bone marrow. Jad answered them with, I'm your guinea pig. When his hair started falling out, he asked me to shave Nike into his hair. The doctor said, what's your mom think of that? He said, my mom did it. <laughs> After a week of chemo, he would be so nauseated and then get mouth sores and couldn't eat. Then his fever would go up to 101, and that would be our signal to go off to the hospital to get IV antibiotics. Soon as he was feeling better, it would be back for another round of chemo. We were so blessed with several what we called our angel nurses. And we were told later they would actually fight to be Jad's nurse because they could feel such a peaceful presence in his room, which we all know that came from God. After four months of chemo and many trips to the hospital, it was then three months of radiation. We thought we were on the road to recovery, and Jad even started playing tennis. We had a foreign exchange student from Peru, and so I homeschooled them both. As Jad was recovering from these treatments, he agreed to play, he agreed to help me coach an eighth grade girls basketball team. He used his expertise to teach them some things that I couldn't teach them. On that team, sitting there at the front is Mark and Joanna Burns' youngest daughter, uh, Julie. Julie. The girls weren't too thrilled about me. I yelled a lot. But they loved Jad. He never yelled. And uh, that love for, for Jad soon was borne out and became very evident. Then in April of 91, Mark and Joanna's older daughter, Lisa, was diagnosed with lymphoma. So we encouraged them to go to see our doctors in Chicago for treatment. Mark Jr. and Jad had been great friends, and so we all went together and had a good old party for a while. And while there with Lisa, Doc Knock, whose name was really Dr. Knockman, but the kids lovingly called him Doc Knock, said, Jad, let's get a picture of your lungs while you're here. Sadly, there were three more tumors discovered in his chest wall. There were several lights that helped us through these dark days in the valley. Doc Knock knew that Jad loved Michael Jordan. So he arranged for Jad to be the honorary ball boy on May 21st, 1991. It was such an exciting day as Jad met all the Bulls players. He got to go in their locker room, but we knew we were in trouble when partway through the game, he asked if he could sit and watch instead of be the ball boy. So then we had surgery again two days later. Traveling to Chicago every couple of weeks and spending a week at a time in Chicago became very expensive. Um, <clears throat> we were blessed to have Ronald McDonald House very nearby, uh, but the expenses still kept piling up. Knowing this, several members of our girls' basketball team decided they were going to do something about it. And they determined that they were going to put together a benefit for Jad and for Lisa. They, um, um, they recruited their parents to help uh, it was going to be played at the Penn, Basque, Penn Palace basketball facility. The only problem was the floor of that uh, facility was, had not yet been finished. So uh, the superintendent of Penn Schools, um, uh, Dean Spiker, gave uh, permission to have overtime, to guys to work overtime in order to get that floor finished so the basketball benefit could take place. One of the families provided a motorhome so we could go up to Chicago and bring Jad back on the motorhome. Um, and one of his nurses volunteered to travel with us so that she, so she could administer IVs on the way so that he could have, uh, he could have um, the IVs that he needed. A guy named Lafonso Ellis, who used to play basketball for Notre Dame, then he went on to play for the Denver Nuggets. He actually helped Jad coach a couple of the teams in those benefit in that, in that benefit game that near that evening nearly 3,000 people showed up multiple games were played sports memorabilia and other items were auctioned off 
and thousands of dollars were raised to help the Bear and the Burns family. And both Jad and Lisa were interviewed that evening. Watch this. Over 3,000 people came to Penn High School tonight for a very special celebrity basketball fundraiser to benefit two very special people. Lisa Burns and Jad Bayer are both students at Penn High School and both have cancer. Three of their friends wanted to do something for Lisa and Jad, and they each had their own reasons. Just to help Jad and Lisa. They've, they've been really great people to us, and I, I felt that we owe it to them. A lot of money to keep going back and forth to Chicago, so we thought we might raise some money for her to help them. Other rally organizers say the community support has been overwhelming. We put this together in about five days, and the support in the Penn community and all over merchants, uh, faculty, administration, friends of the kids have been wonderful. Several games were played. Students from area schools participated, as did several local and other celebrities. But I think as you look around this gym and see the amount of people who came out here to uh, watch and help honor two young people, it's a tribute to the Michiana community. Lisa and Jad both say they're deeply touched by the community's support. It's truly amazing that people really care and that they show up and that they take the time. So I, I was just amazed when I learned about it. Were you surprised? Yeah. <laughs> it really um, is encouraging to know that, um, you know, when you're up in the hospital, you're not always um, sure, you know, if everybody knows and what people are thinking. But, you know, it's nice to know that everybody can rally around you and, you know, and really help you out when you need it. Reporting from Penn High School, Heather Richards, News Center 16. We want to finish up with him looking at a good looking girl because he enjoyed doing that. The, that. But the euphoria from that evening was, was short lived. During our, his time in the hospital uh, and at home as well, Jad spent a lot of time talking to God. And that was Jad talking to God and God talking back to Jad. And during the process, Jad seemed to acquire an awful lot of wisdom that he shared with us as time went by. One day I walked into his room and he was just doing this. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, look at these amazing machines that God made. Look at all the things they can do. Look how you can control. I mean, he just went on and on appreciating God's creation just in our body and in our hands. Another time I wondered, you know, here's a teenager, 17 years old. Does he really want us spending every single night with him at the hospital? And one day I came in from the Ronald McDonald house. Jim had spent the night, and he says, Mom, you have got to go talk to so-and-so down the hall. They leave their kid every night, and he cries, and they need to be here. So in his own special way, he told us, yes, Mom and Dad, you're supposed to be here. And he also went down and and comforted. Talked, comforted those kids that were being left alone. One day as he and I were in the hospital on an evening, he, he asked me this question. He said, Dad, what 17 years? He said, what 17 years compared to eternity? I said, uh, not very much. And then he said, what, 77 years compared to eternity? I said, not very much. He says, exactly the same amount. He doesn't. He went on to say, it doesn't really matter how many years you live. It's how you live those years. End of conversation, drop the mic. I mean, that was it. Heather Richards was a local reporter that interviewed the kids at the benefit. And she got very fond of Jad and Lisa and did several follow-up interviews. Um, when Jad's health had declined, she asked if she could come and interview him one more time. 
and he agreed to that. And so that's what you're going to see right now. You know, cancer is something that you can't plan on, but when it happens, no matter what the outcome, it has a permanent effect on the lives of the patients and their families. In the first part of her look at two local teens who are waging the war against cancer, Heather Richards talks with a 17-year-old who's been fighting for two and a half years. When you have a chance that you've got to keep fighting until, until you, know, you can't fight anymore, which, um... It's been a hard decision for me to make, to say when to stop. But if they think that <clears throat> nothing's going to help this but healing, well, then I've got to put my faith in God to do that. 17-year-old Jad was diagnosed with fibrosarcoma in March of 1989. He's had several operations to remove tumors, but the tumors have now become too numerous to operate on. We used to say we live a day at a time. Well, these last few weeks, it's been a minute at a time. You just never know what the next minute or two minutes is going to bring. I definitely accepted going to heaven, and I've accepted being healed on earth. And I'm just kind of sick of the waiting game. If it's through me dying, if I bring one person or one of my best friends to the Lord, well, then I think it's worth me dying. <laughs> You're hoping always for a storybook ending, but uh, we know that we don't live in a storybook world, and then uh, Jad's got a chance of not making it. But uh, as Jad says, we're, we're counting on, on, a, on a healing. Last spring, thousands of people showed their support for Jad and another local teen who has cancer at a benefit basketball game. The Bears say knowing that they and Jad are in people's thoughts and prayers is about the best encouragement they can have. Reporting from Mishawaka, Heather Richards, News Center 16. It's a hard one to watch. On June 18th, Jad had surgery for a new tumor on his spine. On June 27th, there was another lung surgery, and of course, always the perseverance versus that he would ask for. Next was an inoperable tumor in the abdomen, and doctors said there were no more options. Jad was very quiet all that day. He had not been eating for a couple weeks, just through intravenous feedings. And that evening he said, do you know what I want? I would like some barbecue ribs and squirt. What do I have to lose? So his dad hustled right out and got those. The next day, Jad asked his doctors if he could donate his organs, since we had met children at the hospital and at the Ronald McDonald House who needed organs. But due to cancer, he could not do that. And that was a very another sad day for him. He then asked his dad if it was OK to quit fighting. He said, Dad, I know we bears are sportsmen, and we never give up. But I am tired, and I just want to go to heaven and get a new body. So at 17, almost 18 years, Jad started planning his funeral. He asked his camp friends, called CAers, that Mark Jr. was in, to sing at his funeral. Two dads brought some school friends to see, Dad in, see Jad in Chicago. Before they left, Jad said, you have all been such great friends. Can you do me one more favor and be my pallbearers? The room got completely silent, but Jad lightened the mood by saying, but you all have to wear a suit, and I get to wear a Michael Jordan jersey. Prairie Camp was very important to Jad. He loved that place. Um, it was a place where he connected with all of his friends, but it was also a very spiritual place where he connected with, with God. He had made ma major spiritual decisions at Prairie Camp. He had also received great spiritual help. And after having been diagnosed or uh, given the prognosis of six more months to live, he asked if he could have his funeral at Prairie Camp. And we said, well, we'll do our best, but that really is going to be tough because from June, six months from June is December. And if you've ever been to Prairie Camp, you know that's probably not a place conducive to a December funeral outdoors and all that in northern Indiana. But Jad had obviously made some arrangements with God because 
on his release uh, from the hospital, Jad was, was, prayer camp was going on, so, so Jad asked if he could go. And so Wednesday evening, we loaded up his, uh, Jad and his wheelchair and his oxygen into our van, and we headed out to Elkhart. Upon his arrival, he was swarmed by all sorts of people, and he loved that evening. He loved the fellowship. He loved the singing. He loved the preaching. He just loved prairie camp. And as he was leaving that evening, still surrounded by all of his friends, he told them, he said, he said these words, he said, I'll, I'll be back on Sunday. Early on Friday morning, August the 9th, I was getting ready to suction out his throat, and he said, I'm done. And I said, you mean you're done? I can't suction you? And he says, Mom, I'm done. And so I quickly called the rest of the family to his bed. We surrounded his bed. I got in bed with him and sang, Jesus loves me, which I always sing to every newborn also. And his dad read the perseverance verses again. His brother Jamie got a, a wet washcloth because his mouth, Jad's mouth was so dry and he touched his lips with that. And so on Sunday, Jad got his wish, and he was back at camp meeting. But Can I say something funeral. else, though, about, the, about his passing? Before he died, he, he looked at our, he, looked, he was in our living room, and he looked at the bookcases uh, on the end of our living room. And, uh, he looked, and, and he looked past those bookcases, and he saw something that nobody else saw. And these, words, these are the words that he said. He said, it's all real. Those were his last words. So we were at camp for his funeral. Lisa Burns made it there from the Chicago hospital. They had all kinds of trouble, flat tire on the way, but she got there. His camp friends sang, friends are friends forever. And one of them shared that CA stood for Campers Anonymous. And to get in the group, you had to admit you came to camp because you liked it, not because your parents made you. She also shared how Jab was the youngest in the group. There were about 16 of them, I would say. And they used to kid Jab because he didn't have his driver's license. But then they said at his funeral, he was the last to get his license, but he was the first to get his crown. His youth group from Wakarusa Missionary sang, and various pastors in his life shared. It was a real celebration. We were told about 2,000 were there at the tabernacle, and Jad was there in his Michael Jordan jersey. Also marked in his Bible was some verses that he claimed toward the end of his illness in Isaiah 40, 29 to 31. They were marked in his Bible, and we did bury his Bible with him. I kind of wish we wouldn't have, but we did. <laughs> and here's the verses he wanted. 29 through 31 of Isaiah 40. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. QJ, or uh, GG1, uh, the district superintendent canceled the the Sunday evening missions service afternoon. Sunday, afternoon. Sunday afternoon mission service that was, was supposed to be going on one of the speakers at his funeral was QJ Everest some of you know him and he, he said the, these words he said Jad lived a, a long life in a short time let me repeat that to you Jad lived a long life in a short time. If you knew Q.J. Everest, you can imagine that. His um, children's pastor, Bob Keller, uh, spoke. Uh, Dale Sherry, a former um, uh, staffer here at Gospel Center, sang, How Great Thou Art. Steve Ross, his, his youth pastor, said, Jad taught us how to live, and he taught us how to die. The Wakarusa pastors, Dennis Leinbaugh and, and Dave Dick, were there. And 
Jad had called these two men to our home a few days earlier, and he, he told them, he said, now listen, we're only going to get one shot at some of these people, so we can't mess it up. He said, I want you to make, give an altar call at my funeral. And Dennis talked about how difficult that would be, but he agreed to ask people to accept the Lord in their seats at the funeral. And Jad got his wish. Over the years, we found at least seven people that accepted the Lord at his funeral. And but God didn't reveal it to us all at once. It was through the years. Some of the ones that really made an impact on us were his middle school art teacher, who said he felt like Jad and Lisa, or Jad and Lisa were like angels leading him to God. Someone who drove a friend from Michigan who was working at a camp in Michigan, drove them down. He never even met Jad, and he found the Lord. And then Bobby, Bobby was dating one of the boys friends who was a fellow puppeteer from Indianapolis that we had met at the Fellowship of Christian Magicians. And Bobby accepted the Lord, and today he is a pastor. So that just thrills our hearts. So the question is, what did we learn while we were in the valley? What are some of the lessons? Well, one of the lessons I learned was God did not cause my son's death. God created the world to be a perfect place for perfect eternal people. But man sinned and, and destroyed that perfection. So now sin, disease, and death entered the world. And man is for, was forever a, a victim of the, of the curse of sin. So God didn't cause our son's death. This sick, sinful, fallen world caused his death. I learned that grief is so hard. I never knew how physically draining, not only emotionally you expect that, but physically you can feel a hole in your heart. When they talk about a broken heart, that is real. And eventually that hole starts to heal, but it takes a long time. You can't cry on the outside anymore, but you're crying on the inside. Your stomach's constantly churning. Um, it's a darkness that you have to go through but it, you have to work through it. Um, just when you think you've made it, then something big would hit. Um, people used to worry about us going to funerals, but it was harder for me to go to weddings of Jad's friends. And so things that you don't expect just bring that grief back so heavy. And then I never knew how differently every person in the family handles grief. And so that caused us a whole new year problems, which we're going to speak to next week. I also learned that we must prepare for eternity. You know, we as dads, we want to be the great protectors. We die for our wife, our wife and children. But there are some things we cannot protect them from. Sometimes the enemy is just too strong and cancer is, is such an enemy. Only God can overcome these enemies. <clears throat> and that's why it's so important that we turn our loved ones back, back over to the Lord. They are entrusted to us as gifts for only for a short time. Their health and their lives are all temporary, just as ours is. Our foremost concern must be for the eternal, for the souls. And we must hold loosely to the physical, but we must prepare them for the eternal. Another thing I learned was the importance of family and friends. Friends and family would just show up in Chicago unannounced and bring us a meal or take us out to eat. It was just such a ex wonderful thing. Our pastor at the time was Dennis Linebaugh in Wakarusa, and he would always show up the day we got bad news, which we knew was just God's perfect timing. The Ronald McDonald House was such a blessing, and the director there was a Christian and just such a sweet lady. And she would kind of force us to come and eat together with other families that were going through hard times. And a bond grew there among those families. Kay Wallace, my dear friend who's here today, she would keep Paco at any time. If we had to take off for Chicago at 3 o'clock in the morning because of Jad's fevers, she'd be right there to get Paco. 
She also would clean our house before we came home. Remember how big our house was? 11,000 square feet. So I think she also got helpers to help her sometimes. Um, the Wakarusa Church every Wednesday night would bring frozen dinners because they said if you need to take off for Chicago, you can take them with you to the Ronald McDonald House. Paper goods were brought in. You can't believe how many paper towels and Kleenex and toilet paper and paper plates you go through when you have somebody that's ill. The Burns family and us just struggled together through all the trips to Chicago, and often we'd be at the hospital at the same time encouraging each other. Mark Jr. would come and play video games with Jad a lot. And then five months after Jad's passing, we tried to be there for the Burns family who also lost Lisa. So just reach out to people that are struggling people. You can't imagine how much you are the hands of Jesus to people that are hurting. One more lesson I learned is that you never quite get over the loss. The first of everything is hard. First Christmas, first birthday, first anniversary, first everything. It gets a little bit easier, but that feeling of loss never is, is gone. But every time you get those pangs of sorrow, I try to make a point of, of thanking God for the years we had with our loved one. And the way how, how God blessed us. And, and the fact is that, that if we know where, exactly where something is, it's never lost. And today I know where my son is. He's in heaven. Glorying in the presence of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe some of you today are, are facing difficult times. Sorry. Maybe you find yourself in the valley. Remember, Psalm 23, 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Those words are as true today as they were the day that David penned them. And they're just as true for you. God is with you in your valley even if you don't recognize it. And maybe somebody here is, is in that valley and you just feel lost and alone. God's with you. And maybe you, at this time, you, you would say, I just need somebody to pray with me and for me. The altar is going to be open as we sing our closing song and I'll invite the worship team to get ready to do that. If you need to come and pray, just come and pray thanking God for his presence in the valley. If you want Missy and me to pray with you, we'd be happy to do that too. But would you stand with us and sing this great song of promise because he lives. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And the next day and the next day because he lives. Join us in singing, would you please?